Good afternoon, everyone. I am Paula Fontana, Vice President of Strategic Programming Initiatives with the National Black MBA Association. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to part two of our entrepreneur series, Risk in Your Competitive Landscape, provided to us by Starco. If you haven't already seen in the chat box, we have a link to our conference and career fair. This year, it will be a virtual experience. Um, with our conference, you have the opportunity to additional robust programming such as this, as well as the opportunity to engage with employers and secure a position should that be your goal. So for today, for this series, again, we're partnering with Startco um, and really decided that we needed to provide more robust programming to our entrepreneurs and um, Andre and Starco are definitely pivotal to that strategy. So as far as Andre is concerned, for the past 10 years, he's been working to grow the technology startup uh, ecosystem in Memphis. He builds and operates new programs and resources um, for minorities, women, students, and social organizations. Today, we have an extra treat for you because he will be joined by Tim Smith of B Partners and Gabri Waddell of Soundways. Andre, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Paula, for that introduction. And um, hello, everyone, it's good to see you again. Um, you know, as we've been mentioning, you know, we really want to just have a conversation with you and start some dialogue and provide some content with regards to everything that's happening in the world, in particular with the pandemic, um, but also, um, you know, looking at a lot of the unrest that exists across the country right now and across the world. And how's that impacting our business and what are some tools and some strategies that we can use to help move things forward. And so just want to go through a few things today. Um, give a quick little uh, webinar recap of what we did before, set some more context with the pandemic. We're going to talk today about competitive pressures and risk mitigation and open it up with some questions and discussion with a few guests, as Paula just mentioned. And then we want to talk about what are you coherent in or your coherence premium, driving towards value creation, uh, due diligence for those of you who are out there and raising private capital and private equity. And we'll have some more questions and some announcements towards the end. So we have a lot to cover today and uh, we're just gonna jump right in. What we did last time was really talk about level setting the business, right? With so much uncertainty that was out there um, and an evolving landscape, you know, where were we? And we talked about looking at the different 20 components of your business um, what has changed with your concept, strategy, um, how are customer relations been impacted, um, operational controls and organizational structure were a few of the things we discussed. We also talked about a process, a design process for building, uh, really emphasizing customer discovery and talking to your customers out there to get feedback from where you're at today, but also being able to experiment, uh, learn from those experiments and let that inform how you build a better case going forward for resources. All of these things that I mentioned today can be found um, at our website, which is www.neverstop.co. And at the bottom, there are toolkits that you can click on that all of these tools that we reference, some of which we've created, others are open source tools that we leverage out there. One of the things we've been having great dialogue about with many startups and small businesses um, across the country is the landscape of uncertainty and the pandemic has really accelerated this uncertainty that's out there. Um, it's always difficult to start a business or reinvent yourself even before the pandemic and it forces us to really think through um, how we're contextualizing the problem. Uh, was the problem before the pandemic um, the same problem that you're trying to address today? And then also looking at what limitations has the pandemic brought to us in terms of crafting our solution? You know, do you have access to the same resources that you had access to, the same partners that you had access to? Are things tighter now? Is the human capital chain looking a little bit differently and you have to reorg some of the things that you've been delivering on in the past? These are all things that, that bring uncertainty to the table that we have to, we have to troubleshoot. And then adoption, this has been a big one. Uh, we have to really think through Will your customers and clients respond the way they were before? 
Uh, we have to get them to take on your solutions and actually implement them. And then a couple other things here, uh, when you speak to the uncertainty landscape, consequence and identity. Typically, we talk about this when dealing with social enterprises, but I thought it might be um, important for this conversation, considering a lot of the protesting that's been going on, the fight for justice that's out there as well. Um, are there any you know, unintended consequences that come with the result of launching your solution and growing it forward? Do we need to be more aware of what we're actually building into this community and see what impacts it has to others that are out there? And then identity is really looking at, hey, is your business um, really resonating with you and giving you a sense of purpose? You know, a lot of folks out there, the light bulbs are going off for the first time for many of them where there are others who've been having these conversations for years, but maybe they need to make sure that there's purpose when they wake up every day. And maybe a lot of things that are happening out there is making them rethink it. And then managerial, we really have to think this through. Um, a lot of the things we're getting hit with today, maybe you might get hit with one of them in the, in the past at a time. You might be getting hit today by three, four, or five of them. And what's your process for making sure we can look down on the business versus always being in the weeds of the business? And so what is our process for innovation that we rely on that help us move through? So there's a lot of uncertainty out there that we're thinking through. Sometimes it's good to work with your teams uh, to think through, has the problem changed? Can we still deliver on the solution the way that we had been? Um, will our customers respond and adopt what we're talking about? And then also, what is the consequence of our actions and our solutions we're launching? Do we have a sense of purpose? And then also, what's our process for innovation? So these are things that we really need to be thinking through right now. Sure, most of you are familiar with competitive pressures, but we just want to hit on it again to see if anything has changed. Many times we spend a lot focused on existing competition and really trying to understand who's those, that closest threat to us. And so I won't spend as much time on that right now. Um, I want to spend time on the other areas of the landscape that could be impeding on you today. You know, threats of new products and services. What's happening out there, if you think about it, because of the pandemic, because of the protesting, because of what's going on today, there's lots of new products and services being rolled out immediately. And what does that have an impact on with regard to your business? We need to make sure we're keeping an eye out. Innovation is a very fast process and speed is the advantage that you have to be working with. So who else is working fast to bring solutions that might be a substitute for your solution? We also have to think through your bargaining power with suppliers. Right now, what is the state of your suppliers? How are they being impacted by everything that's going on out there? Do you have bargaining power with them if you owe them money or resources or things of that nature? Or do they move you around and set the terms? Same thing goes with purchasers. Are purchasers just walking away? Will they drive your price the way they wanna see it? Or can you hold ground with them and help you with your business moving forward? And then other things in terms of substitution, what can your customers or clients do to just substitute out your service, right? Could they just manually do it? You know, we make a little joke sometimes, um, you know, there's a $100 uh, rubber band holder, do they decide just to use the back of a doorknob? These are things that you wanna be thinking through in terms of these competitive pressures. And if you think of this, if you were to outline this on a, on a chart or a piece of paper where your business is in the middle and these five pressures are converging on you into the center, what are we doing to hold them at bay? And that's what, what we want to be doing here. We need to have a strategy. And sometimes we recommend ranking where you stand in each of these, something as simple as a, a scale of one to five. And, um, and the goal is there's going to be some areas you're very weak in. But the goal is for the majority of them, do you have a plan, do you have a strategy, and what are you gonna do about it, right? So these are things that are really impacting um, businesses right now. And it's good for us to understand these competitive pressures during a time of pandemic, because we need to know what we're up against, all right, in terms of these new solutions that we're gonna be trying. Now, risk mitigation is, is going to be very, very important. And I'm not sure how much time we spend talking about risk. Um, I, I think it's very, very important considering the times that we're in right now. And there's, a, um, there's an article written, it's called The Startup Entrepreneur's Guide to Risk Management by Nick Carlson. It's written a number of years ago. And it just does a good job of outlining the different types of risks that are out there. 
And it touches on these four types of risk. Um, ignorable risk, you know, we put on here like a flat tire. All right, you get it fixed, you move on. Um, you know, a, a nuisance risk. Okay, the printer's out of ink. We, we have to get that done. It, it slows us down a little bit. You know, insurable risk. Okay, earthquake hits, you know, and, and, and hopefully there's insurance that can help us cover that. Um, but it really hones in on what it calls the company killers. Okay, and this is really looking at um, risk in, in terms of competitive risk, market risk, technology risk, operational risk, human capital risk, uh, things that keep you up at night that could really hurt the business um, and maybe even shut it down depending upon where, what stage you are in your life cycle. And so what we want to be doing is first identifying them put them down on a piece of paper, understand what they are, and then come up with a strategy for planning around them. We emphasize risk a lot with many of the companies that we work with because just as much um, that we wanna be building the perfect solutions that can go make money, we also have to make sure we're de-risking the company. And many times in terms of companies that are approaching for capital, we ask these types of questions to see how they're preparing for it. And so we spend just as much time talking through risk um, as we do talking about product or services that they're trying to implement. So just to kind of outline this a little bit, and then we'll open it up to discussion with our guests today. Um, we recommend many times putting together a risk table. And we talked about this at the last um, webinar that we had. And what we want to do is, is basically one, identify these, these maybe five to eight risks that are keeping you up at night and then categorize it by what type. And so I put a couple in here that we've been having some discussions with folks with regards to the uh, pandemic. You know, there are many people who realize that manual processes have started to cripple the firm. Maybe they could get away with it before, but now that everything's going virtual, um, this operational risk, as we're gonna call it, has a high likelihood of impacting the business in a very negative way. Um, consequences are they can't scale the business, and then we wanna come up with some mitigation tactics. Um, maybe there's an operations review, um, tech and automation through processes and systems that we need to put in place that can streamline those operations. And then also we wanna think about, you know, what is it gonna cost us, right, in order to do these things? Maybe you have to train people, maybe there has to be conversions, maybe there's dollars that have to be invested. And so then you put on here, well, what's our status? Okay, you could put on here, not begun. And I have this listed just for a couple here, just to kind of give you some examples. Do this exercise with your team and maybe look in on it once a month. See where you stand, list them out, and hopefully you're starting to put together a plan for executing against some of these risks, all right? And you'll have to prioritize what you wanna work on. If you go through this and you actually plan for it, you will have much better dialogue with investors who are looking to invest in your company, right? They want to know this. They may ask these questions in different ways, but imagine if you actually had a risk table built out, you understood this a little bit better, it would make for just better dialogue with the investors that you're talking to. And so I think this is very important. I, I listed a couple others here. Um, we know that some pe people lost their customers due to the pandemic. Um, this was a form of market systemic and regulatory risk. Why? You know, regulatory may be something that many of us haven't had to deal with before, but now new regulations are impacting the whole country. Now startups and businesses are dealing with regulations um, that they've never had to deal with before. You could never have dreamed of some of these different um, laws and regulations that are being passed. Um, but it also speaks to the market risk. You know, um, do we need to look at new customers and what the demand will be for your products and services? Um, and then there are systemic issues that sit in here as well. Likelihood, it could be very high. We've seen some companies who lost 80% of their business. They've had to quickly now mitigate, look for new customers, learn behavior, adjust services, sell differently, right? So I'm not gonna go through all of these. I just wanted to give you a few examples. And this is something that you can be doing. It's a simple exercise and just working with your teams moving forward. Okay, so wanted to actually have this discussion with our guest, um, you know, Gabri and Tim, and I think I'm gonna start with Tim. Um, Tim uh, Smith with B Partners based in San Francisco. Would you mind just giving a, a brief background on yourself and B Partners before we get started here? Sure, Andre. Uh, I am in fact a Memphis native, as we discussed a little earlier. I'm born and raised in Memphis, so Southerner by, by heart. Uh, I've been in San Francisco for about 35 years now. 
I'm actually more on the founder side of the table. Uh, since uh, I've been the founder of eight companies now, uh, uh, about four exits out of those eight. Uh, not all are winners, uh, but a substantial exit was one of them. The, uh, the past three years, I've been a partner with an early stage venture capital uh, company. That's what happens to founders when your wife won't let you start any more companies. Uh, so I'm on that side of the table now, but the, I've seen both sides of the table, both in pitching uh, VCs. I've pitched most of the, the venture capital firms on Sand Hill Road and also on the diligence side now uh, in evaluating very early stage. B Partners is a seed uh, venture capital firm. Uh, we invest at the very earliest stage. We're typically the first check in. Our check sizes are around 750, uh, and we are we typically lead the earliest rounds. So we see a really interesting mix of uh, first time founders uh, and second time founders. And I can talk more about the difference between the two because they're substantial. Uh, and we look at about 3,000 deals a year. So we see quite quite an arc of interesting uh, of interesting ideas out there. So that's pretty much my story. Thanks, Tim, and um, we'll, we'll come back to you here with a couple of questions. Um, also want to introduce uh, Gabri Waddell with Sound Credit. Gabri, do you mind just giving a, a brief background and, and, and what, your, what your company is doing? Uh, sure thing. Uh, so yes, my name is Gabri Waddell. I'm CEO of Sound Credit. So every year there's about 1.4 billion in unpaid music royalties, mostly because the music industry has never had a system for collecting credits of who did what and delivering that information through the supply chain. Uh, we were the first company to do this and it was the most viral music software release in history. Um, I, I serve on the board of directors of the Smithsonian Rock and Soul Museum. I hold state office in Tennessee as an appointee to the Tennessee Entertainment Commission. And uh, after being elected this year, I'm uh, very proud to serve on the National Board of Trustees of the Recording Academy, which is the organization behind the Grammy Awards. Well, thanks, Gabri, and, and let's just stay with you here. Um, would love to just hear about how risk has impacted your business um, and, and any examples of uh, maybe how maybe you weren't prepared um, for, for some of this that was coming at you. Yeah, I think, you know, we, uh, of course, we worked with you, Andre, early on, which was an incredible experience. I, I really can't uh, recommend uh, the consulting and the, the thinking that you've introduced to so many companies uh, it, well enough. You know, I, I really couldn't uh, uh, express that as, as, as full as it should be uh, to folks. It really helped us. And I've got to say, you know, we embraced this uh, concept of, uh, of customer discovery as a way of having some insurance against risk. And this isn't just something we tout. This is, I'm talking about real work here. Uh, so this, um, this is a 250 page uh, book that of cu formal customer discovery that we've done just with Universal Music Group alone. Uh, that formal B2B customer discovery is, is essential. And uh, of course, Universal Music Group is the largest record label in the world. And this is just the start. All, all of this insight was baked into millions of lines of code that delivers on the most painful problems that we identified through this process. Of course, we had to go just as deep with Warner Brothers, with Apple Music, and so many others in the space to make certain that what we were building is solving a truly painful and, you know, and a range of costly problems that exist throughout the supply chain. And, and so, you know, Tim, when, when you hear Gabri, you know, talk about that, um, I'm curious from, from an investor standpoint, how, how you have seen risk impact companies um, and, and how maybe they should have better prepared um, in terms of coming after capital. Well, so, you know, I mentioned the, uh, I mentioned the fact that we see a wide range of founders at B Partners. We see a lot of first time founders and we see second time founders that we typically invest in again. Uh, and one of the biggest differences is a kind of a somewhat of an avoidance of, of, uh, of the risk in, early, in first time founders. Uh, we talk a lot with our teams about facts and fears. And when you're faced with any type of market change and certainly as, as profound as what we're working with now, you want to know what the facts of your circumstances are. That ties right back to your opening with all of the considerations you want to make. But also what tends to get ignored is, you know, what's the worst case scenario? And I think it's perfectly healthy. In fact, we seem to be very productive to go all the way there. 
what happens when 80% of your team has been riffed? What happens when you, your runway is, is much, much shorter than you think? Go all the way there and at least go through the thought exercise of what you would do in those circumstances. And frankly, it becomes somewhat of a relief uh, if you've explored that boundary and come back. Now with second time founders, third time founders, uh, this is almost their natural intuition. I can tell you as an eight time founder, I'm awful, often called the paranoid on, on the team as the partner uh, because I'm always saying, well, what if this goes wrong? That's coming from lots of arrows in my back, let me tell you. And we've seen that the founders that recognized risk, recognized threat as early as possible and were the first to put in contingency plans were the ones that are surviving right now. We've had failures across the portfolio of 60 companies and we've had uh, those companies that have thrived and the ones that addressed the worst case scenarios and had contingency plans and acted swiftly are surviving. Well, and to, to follow up on that, Gabri, you know, I'm curious because what he's speaking to is, is, is a, constant, um, a constant plan for risk. And so be able to come in and look at it, evaluate it, and, and make sure you never forget about it. And I know, Gabri, you know, we've all gone through ups and downs. What you started out with is different than where you're at today. So I know some risk has hit you. Could you give a little bit of the journey of how you got to where you are today and, and understanding that sound credit is what you want to focus on, but you didn't start that way. Yeah. So, you know, thinking about that and, you know, the risk that comes up, one of the things that comes to mind are, you know, the, the companies that arose after we released our software and proved to the industry that this was an important space. We had these imitations come up, you know, these companies that would hire contractors to make these imitations of our of our platform. And uh, when those happened, we had to respond and thinking through the risk making a risk plan gave us something we could immediately go to also the work of Clayton Christensen, you know, and Michael Porter to make sure that, uh, you know, if when things arise that you're distinct from them. You know, you have your unique value proposition, uh, your, your unique place in the marketplace. And when something arose, we, make sure, we made sure that we were observing it, that we were uh, figuring out what it is that they were going after. In many cases, it was, you know, it, in all cases, actually, with uh, the competitors that popped up for us, uh, it was, you know, they weren't taking it from a position of the discovery and the deep base with the discovery uh, approach that we've taken. So they were going after uh, parts that were more their own technical indulgences rather than solving real problems that were out there in the marketplace. Uh, so for us, we took into account what they were doing. We make sure that what we're building is distinct from that, is unique from that. Uh, you know, small course corrections as we go. Of course, making sure that any existing players in the space, uh, Nielsen, uh, all music, uh, music databases that are out there, that we're not repeating the work that they're doing. We're, we're, uh, we're owning our own unique individual space. And that's, that has really been a, a big piece of it for us. So, so it sounds like, one, being aware, being educated on the industry in the space, constant self-evaluation, right, and making adjustments as you go. Um, you know, I'm curious, you know, Tim, in terms of your experience, whether it's as a, as a founder or whether it's as an investor, you know, I'm, I'm curious in terms of, you know, how, how you feel about the different types of risks that are out there. Um, a lot of times when you, when you look at risk and you evaluate it and you plan for it, it actually creates new opportunities in terms of what you should do. You know, sometimes we're so super laser focused on, we got to build this thing. And then you kind of see the, the risk landscape and you say, oh, wow, we hadn't actually thought about a delivery system. We hadn't actually thought about being prepared for this competitive pressure. And actually what you're building becomes better, it becomes stronger and kind of moves it forward. So I don't know if you've seen any of that or have any thoughts along those lines. Yep, seen an awful lot of that. The, uh... I also do, I, I teach a workshop at, at Cal Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, and have for years now on rapid prototyping and testing. And it's amazing that we see brilliant engineers, brilliant uh, uh, business graduates coming out of Haas at, at, at the number one public university in the world who understand basic design thinking, but they don't understand how and how, how, and how often they have to get in front of their customers and test. Gabri mentioned this before, and I, I don't know Gabri, but this is the voice of an experienced founder. I can tell very, 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 very easily uh, that you, you test with, with your customers much more frequently than is most 
uh, uh, thought, thought of, and there are, pro there are processes for doing that, but you're also out there, uh, you're, you're gonna have competition like Gabri mentioned. You're going to have fast followers, followers if you innovate in a space. And we are, you know, I throw up a red flag almost every time when we see these thousands of pitches we get in California, when I hear, you know, we're gonna be Uber for blank. Uh, that's a red flag for me, because that means that you're probably talking about an incremental change to an existing platform or an incumbent platform, like Gabri may have been the incumbent platform in his space. So if you're only a thin veneer on an incumbent, you've got problems. If you're an innovator in the space, you've got to defend that space. And differentiation could not be more key. And differentiation is, this, is in the eye of the customer, not your team. And this is hence the importance of getting your idea out there frequently. And as you iterate and test and sprint, uh, it's gonna change over time. But you always, always be testing, uh, as we say. That's the only way you're gonna know if you're staying ahead of those, in, those uh, fast followers that Gabri talked about. Well, thanks for that. And, and just one more question for both of you, and then we'll, we'll share a few more slides and open it back up a little bit later. On the competitive pressures, you know, I mean, obviously there's, there's this landscape, um, you know, Michael Porter speaks to it, but I'm curious which ones you have seen um, that, that really spoke to either Gabri, your startup, or Tim, what you've been seeing, and we'll start with Gabri here, was it existing competition? I mean, I know you talked about these imitations, so maybe it was threats of new entrants. Was it supplier relationships or these partnerships you have to build? Was it your purchasers or your clients weren't responding the way you thought that they would? Um, or could someone just substitute you out for something else? I mean, Gabri, what, what in there was, was troubling you or you had to really work through? You know, I'd say with, uh, with the substitutions, I feel like that's a lesson that you have to you have to you have to uh, observe early. Uh, the substitutions are going to be there right at the outset of product discovery, and it's easy to um, it's easy to sort of dismiss them. If customers are using an Excel spreadsheet to solve the problem that you're solving, uh, you can't dismiss that. You have to know why is it that that worked all the way up to 2020. You know, you, and for us that was important to do. Uh, we had people that were collecting things into Word documents, was, which is atrocious for many reasons, but there were a couple of reasons that were valid why they were doing it that way. And we had to make sure we were gathering the insight from that and baking it into the product. And so I'd say, you know, with the pandemic, I feel like it somewhat mitigates the threat of new entrants because it's a more difficult, difficult time to do uh, fundraising and to raise a team. It's just harder to do that right now. But I'd like to say that one thing that's going on right now that I would be super remiss if I didn't uh, mention here on this call with this audience uh, is that the bargaining power of, uh, you know, of the purchaser and the supplier, you, that, that dynamic is changing in this era of the racial reckoning that we're experiencing with Black Lives Matter. Because right now in this moment, corporate America is thinking more about diversity than ever and focusing on those diversity and inclusion officers uh, that are there. Uh, you know, th that, that is a big shift and we are feeling that. I'm gonna see if I can switch over to my screen really quickly and just show something. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work. Let's see if this works. So if, uh, okay, so if, uh, if you search Apple procurement right now, the first thing that comes up is this page. And on that page, the second heading that we see is supplier diversity program. Uh, this, this is a big deal. This is a big deal for us right now because with this focus, a new opportunity is arising for founders of color. And, um, and many people on this call right now may already be uh, conducting supplier diversity programs themselves. Uh, and I'd like to, like to show a couple of things we've been working on, you know, with the Recording Academy, there's, we've, uh, this announcement happened just today, came out in Billboard about partnering with Color of Change. Uh, they were uh, really tremendous in uh, the event that the Obama Foundation did uh, a few months ago uh, which I was just so proud of that event happening the way that it did. It make me, made me feel a lot better as the movement was going on. Uh, you know, uh, and with this has, again, yes, there's, there's a really big shift that's happening there. 
I'd like to drill down that just a little bit before we move on. So, you know, in the federal space, we have 49 CFR sections 23 through 26, which mandates goal setting for federal contracts for dollars to go to minority owned businesses. But with private companies, you know, we don't have that mandatory enforcement, but we do have policies. And for diversity inclusion officers that are out there, they can make those policies. So I think one thing we can do in the African American business community right now is to talk to these diversity inclusion officers, make sure that those div diversity supplier programs uh, are in place and there's quantified goals and it's codified into policy in their organization. And um, on the uh, other side of this, I'd like to say, you know, the support system that we see for founders, a lot of times with incubators and the accelerator programs that are out there, I haven't seen a lot of um, consulting for founders of color to connect with experts in supplier diversity. Uh, a friend of mine is a, a longtime civil rights attorney uh, who's helped us navigate that a little bit and give some insight on that. And there is a whole world uh, that is there that is important to get to know. So yeah, many people on the call will already be familiar with that, but I have to say we have a real responsibility to our community and in what we do right now to make sure that there is a focus on supplier diversity and we become informed on it and that we advocate for it. Well, thanks for that, Gabri, and uh, thanks for those insights and, and sharing. Uh, Tim, you know, what have you been seeing in terms of competitive pressures? Anything resonate um, that, that, that we're speaking about here? Well, I want to talk, before I go to competitiveness, I want to, I want to reflect what Gabri said, which was really powerful. Uh, there's, there's been a, a complete groundswell shift here. Uh, you know, look, I, you know, I'm a white guy on this call. It's obvious. Uh, we are changing our stance uh, relationship to the world because we have a little bit of a lever. We're a small team at B Partners in San Francisco. We're in a bit of a bubble out there, that California bubble. But about three and a half years ago, we started a program led by my colleague, Kira Noodleman, uh, to, uh, to address female founders uh, in the marketplace, which was another underserved community. Uh, we worked our, our butts off for three years and all of a sudden we have three times more female founders in the B portfolio than I think any other VC uh, in Silicon Valley. It was a really hard road to get there. Our next project right now uh, is, uh, is taking a very close look at the black and brown community. That's why I joined your last call here, Andre, and I'm joining a lot more like that. We have a mandatory DNI paper uh, that is part of our onboarding for every team that we invest in. Every company in Web Best End gets DNI directives from us. And we follow up as we, we take board positions and we, it's always on the agenda item, where are we on diversity and inclusion? And that's the whole gamut, uh, not just black and brown folks. So we've been extremely active and I would encourage the community on this call, the times have changed. And I would be real careful of, to watch all of the various VCs and other communities who are writing the check and authoring the medium article and thinking that's a check in the box. That's not check in the box. We're, we're looking at a very long-term plan at, at B Partners, just like we did with female founders. And probably the first year of what we're doing is listening, not talking. And so we're doing a lot of listening this year, even though I'm talking now. We're doing a lot of listening, and we're, we're talking about putting together an advisory committee, just like an LPAC, uh, that will advise us that we will listen to, to help us figure out how we can have the same success with black and brown and other minorities that we've had with female founders. Now on competition, uh, competition is what makes this engine work, okay? And it makes it thrive, it makes this whole machine work. So we love competition, but as I said about differentiation uh, and early uh, recognition of how, of, uh, how fallible or how exposed you are against the market, these are all extremely important things for you to track. Surprises happen in January, we had one assessment of our portfolio. In literally February, March, we had a completely different assessment where we were stack ranking the viability of our companies in January. One way, we, we have a completely different stack rank of co a COVID ranking right now because we have healthcare investments that are thriving, as you might imagine. We have logistics companies, deliveries, companies that are going through the roof right now. And we have a lot of other companies that are hurting pretty bad. So uh, you just have to take it a day at a time. We do a lot of testing, a lot of sprinting, a lot of trying out products and getting them in front of customers on literally weekly sprints, testing them and iterating fast. 
Um, that's really the only way you survive right now. Well, um, thank you both for your, your great insights. I think these are, are very great conversations that we need to be having today. One, um, just understanding your landscape better, but then two, um, that leads us to the questions around where we're at today um, in this pandemic and this in the state of the country. And there's opportunities that sit out there for this network. So we're hoping people are listening and, and understanding that. Let me run through a couple of more slides and we'll start the discussion back up here again. One second here. One of the things I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, because if the opportunity is right for you to innovate, um, we have to ask ourselves, are we coherent? And uh, this is a, a, based on a PWC article that was written probably about seven or eight years ago. And, um, a lot of folks say, uh, well, what, what does that mean exactly? And I think many times we, we look at um, entrepreneurship the incorrect way. Um, many people have lots of ideas, lots of concepts, and they think it's about addition, when really it's a process of subtraction and really honing in on what works for you well and how you deliver it very, very well. And so just some things to think about, you know, um, you know can we state it? You know, how do we play? Are we clear about how we choose to create value in the marketplace? Um, our capabilities. Can we articulate the three to six capabilities that describe what we do uniquely better than anyone else and have defined how they work together in a system? I think sometimes we, we maybe have identified the capabilities, but not how they work together in a system. And I think this is very important, you know, for us to move forward. And have we, have we specified our, our product and service sweet spot, right? And so I think we have to first be able to say it. And a lot of times, if you do this exercise with your team, your team members might have a different answer than you. And so we have to really understand what's going on there, right? You know, and so someone who's coming at it from the sales side, they may have a very different perception of this than someone who's building the technology. And this is why we have to understand how we have to collaborate and communicate and then all get on the same train. And then once we can state it, do we live it, right? Are we investing in the capabilities that really matter to our way of play, right? And do all of our businesses draw on the superior capability system? See, a lot of times when you're starting up, you can get spread thin, right? Because maybe you're running low on money. Maybe there's consultant work that sits in there. You meet a client, you pitch them, and they say, well, that sounds great, but could you just do this instead? Or could you tweak it this way? And you start to get stretched away from your core capabilities. And then all these inefficiencies come in, waste of money, waste of time, waste of resources. You might even lose team members because you're not focused on what you sold them on, right? These are things that are very important. And this is not easy. It, it may take sometimes a decade before you can become truly coherent, but we should always be working towards it. And I think this is very, very important. Um, in the beginning, we've been talking about the landscape and risk, et cetera. But at some point, you have to pierce through that landscape with your core capability system. And so just to give you an example that, that can make sense to everyone here, you know, Walmart was very, very good at three core things. A lot of times people think of Walmart and they may think of falling prices in the store and just look at them as a, as a, as a large, uh, super complex store. But really, it was their point of sale management. Uh, their inventory system and management around that and how they used capital. It was those three things that allowed for them to deliver in a great way to their client base, right? And so many times it may not actually be how you interact with the client as what you're truly coherent in. And so you have to ask yourself, what are the things that you're truly coherent in? What are those capabilities and how you deliver it in a system? Another thing that many times happens here is we never get to the delivering in a system and we're doing what I call one-off support to clients. There's no economies of scale. And so we're basically starting over from scratch with every client that we're working with. And so sometimes we have to really think through, are we using our capabilities in the right way? I think this speaks a lot to moving from value proposition to value creation. You know, so we've all seen different tools and, and documents that speaks to, hey, what's your value proposition, right? Meaning you have this service or this product, and then what are the benefits that you are now going to be selling to your client? 
And so a lot of times, I've even noticed with companies that have been around for a long time, they're still selling value proposition. And sometimes we push them to look at it differently and sell value creation. And so some people say, what's the difference? Well, you can show ROI. If I have many companies that I've talked to, they're generating numbers and they're still selling value proposition when they can simply state, we save our clients this much money. We actually have increased customer satisfaction by this percentage. We've actually done this, et cetera. Now, with my background in financial services, there's no guarantee of future returns, but you can always use what you've done in terms of now tightening your sales materials, your investor presentations, and what you're going to do. So don't have it out there where you're already generating value and you're not selling what you actually create. And I would have quantified it by now. This is very important. It may require you to do some data mining, but that's very, very critical so that you are selling actually where you're at. And I think understanding your risk, your competitive pressures, it allows you to truly think through the value you wanna create and also make, to make sure you're articulating it very, very well. And then you start working towards being coherent across the organization. What happens now is many of us are not coherent right? And so it's, it's almost like a struggle sometimes to do what I call the bread and butter product and service that we love to do because all these other things are pulling you backwards. You know, a lot of times we focus on business model canvases, but you could also look at an operating model canvas. You just Google that, it'll pop up. And you think about your supplier relationships. You think about the locations of your employees. You think about your information systems, your management systems, and the organization of your human capital. And you ask yourself one question, are they accelerating how we deliver value or are they slowing us down? And, and you need to assess that. So these are all things that we need to be thinking about when we think about our landscape, when we think about risk factors, competitive pressures, et cetera. And these are just some notes that might be able to help you in terms of having some good dialogue with your teams. You know, we'll open this up here in a minute. A lot of times, you know, when we're raising private investment, you know, we're hoping to get to a due diligence process with, with investors. And, um, you know, many times we think we've entered due diligence with investors when we really haven't. Um, maybe you've had a couple of conversations. Um, you know, I think uh, Tim had mentioned they, they reviewed something like 3,000 a year. Well, have we actually gotten to the point where we're getting on their watch list? Um, where they're actually having discussions in their, in their team meetings about you as the company? Do we even know what questions to, to ask? Um, but at some point, if they're interested, they'll ask you to go through due diligence where they want you to provide answers to a series of questions that really can pick apart the business. And I think many times as founders and, and, and startups that are out there, we're so focused on getting across the technology or the solution. And then you realize in this due diligence packet that they've given you, there's pages of other things they are asking you. And so I think many times in this conversation, we're not considering enough risk and how to combat it and have a plan. And I'm sure Gabri and Tim here in a minute can, can speak to this. Um, one from a, a startup's perspective, who maybe they weren't prepared for the first due diligence process that they went through, but also from an investor's perspective in terms of what they see when people uh, take their first stab at going through the process who maybe had not had any experience with that before. And so um, let's, let's open it up again here. Um, you know, Tim, I'll start with you um, coming from the investor side. Any thoughts you can provide about that dialogue around due diligence, preparedness, and maybe not considering some of the things we're talking about today? Yeah, let me get to that. I want to go back to your coherence uh, point for a second, Andre. Uh, the, the, the brand, I personally believe that the brand and voice of a company comes from the CEO, comes from the founder. And uh, we, if you're talking about how to express that across a company and reinforce that over time, we talk a lot, uh, you'll hear the phrase at B a lot, factus non verbis, which is roughly translates to, you know, uh, deeds before words or action uh, is more valuable than words. Uh, and I believe that the actions of a company, in fact, define the brand and the actions of a company in fact, define the brand statement over time. Uh, and as a, as a CEO, well, I mean, my longest run was about 10 years, you know, going from my number one tool after 10 years of reflecting as a CEO on one company, going from, you know, one person, me, to, you know, up to three, four, five, six hundred people. It was the monthly meeting 
you know, that we had on rails, all hands meeting where we practiced and re reinforced and celebrated what we were and how we talked about our company. And it's practicing that muscle memory in front of your constituency, which is your, your, your employees. That's what works the best. Now, the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the following question, the, you know, we talk, you've heard the product market fit is, a, is a, a, a phrase we use a lot. At the earliest stage where we work and invest, we look at product, founder problem fit is the, really the number one uh, flag for us. Uh, so when we talk about fast followers, when Gabri was talking about fast followers, you have a lot of those. We have a lot of super op opportunistic ventures that we're seeing a lot around COVID right now. The first thing you want to look at is, do you have deep experience in this domain? And in almost every case, you, the, the founders do not. And the best indication of, you know, when we do diligence, uh, we do ask the tough questions. And I've been on both sides of the table, so I know how to feel those and how to present those. But the best founders, the founders that I love the most, the ones that get me so excited are the ones that come in. They may come in with a deck. They may come in with the pitch. They may come in with the pro forma numbers, et cetera. But it's the ones who talk about ROI, to your point, Andre, the ones that talk about act, actual action, not, not what they're saying. And it's the ones that stand up and get on the whiteboard and, and interact with you and your questions for the next hour. Those are the exciting founders. The ones that just read from a deck of their, pro, their value proposition and not their progress are the ones that, um, that don't really typically pass the test. Thanks for that, uh, Tim, for that good perspective. Uh, Gabri, um, what, what's your experience and, and going through due diligence? Uh, any insights you can, you can share? Uh, yeah, so I, I laugh when I heard Tim say problem founder fit, because that is exactly, that hits a lot of nails on a lot of heads. That, that was, it, that's exactly right to me. Uh, if you've got the direction, if you've got the insight, if you've got the industry uh, connection, you've got the relationships, if you've got the technical acumen and the ability to bring something to market, if, if you've got that, as far as the due diligence and everything around it, that, then you go to people like you, Andre, and, and you get prepped for all that part of it and you do it. And any of you that think you can't do that, if you've got those skills and those connections, I'm telling you right now, you can do that. Let me give you that confidence in this moment right now. If you're connected to an industry and you understand a problem deeply and you've cultivated that authority and that ability in that area over years, then you're gonna be able to solve those problems and you're gonna be able to connect to these investors like Tim and make, this, make that thing happen. Uh, so I just wanna give you that bit of confidence right now. For me, uh, you know, I, in the, for the world, I was a, a small business person for years. I operated a studio uh, and I worked with many famous celebrity clients uh, for years. Um, when, it, when, it, when I thought about the world of investment in this, I, I never thought that that would happen. I just didn't think that that was for me. And I think that's an experience that a lot of African-American founders uh, can feel. And not without reason, because there is a s small percentage of us that get VC investment. That has been a difficult uphill battle, but that is changing because of this racial reckoning that's happening today. And this is a moment for you. Uh, so uh, I'd like to say that as well. Um, but yeah, I'd just say, you know, making sure the problem solution fit is there, doing the discovery, uh, making sure you're heading in the right direction, and, uh, and the due diligence part, it, it, it naturally uh, follows. Well, well, both of you mentioned a couple of things there, and, and I'd love to get a quick follow-up. You know, you're, you're, you're speaking, uh, there's a great book um, that just kind of contextualized uh, selling software. Uh, a lot of things we already know is just kind of put it together, uh, the Lean B2B book. Um, forgetting the author's name right now, but but it really spoke to um, what it emphasized being important in, in, in the startup phase, and it spoke right to that that domain expertise um, first and foremost. You know, a lot of times people focus right on the, the 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 technical expertise, but but really the domain expertise we'll see many times. Um, you may be selling on an enterprise or, or a customer, and if you don't understand how that industry works, um, you know, we we had a couple examples where we had startups who were offering a um, solution that would eliminate one of their biggest supplier relationships that they've had for a hundred years. And they should probably be talking to that supplier and not the actual enterprise. And, and so if they had any expertise in the industry, they would have known that. 
And so I'm curious what you all think because that book mentions domain expertise first and foremost, technical expertise, but then sometimes put passion <laughs> even, even above. And so I'm just curious um, in terms of the, the folks who approach you or Gabri with your team, how has that been important or a necessity? Uh, maybe um, we'll start with Tim and we'll come back to Gabri and, and we'll close up here. Well, let, let me say that uh, the people that on this call and beyond, I hope that Gabri just directly spoke to, uh, those with a passion, with the main experience, with an idea, who have maybe been, uh, you know, cautious about trying to start something, I would second that that encouragement to dive in. Those are the people we want to talk to. And the reason I'm here on this call is I want those, I would like for those people to consider calling us uh, because we're leaning in really hard. We'd like to hear from them. The, um, uh, you know, the thing about, uh, the thing about, what I said about you know founder problem fit. This is this is pretty paramount. Building products uh, in the digital space has never been easier, frankly. Never been cheaper. Never been easier. The first big company I founded was in 1993, one year before the internet. There were maybe 10 people in San Francisco that could write HTML, and they were worth a lot of money. The first website that my company designed was for Nike, not a small company. We charged them $500,000 for that site. It was nothing, right? But that's when you could do it. But right now, domain expertise, passion, are that's what we look for. And the, the other thing is starting companies is really, really, really hard. You have to have a level of tenacity uh, and perseverance and, uh, and, and uh, a pain threshold level that is very high. There's a lot of fallout. So we look for those people. That's why we have a very complex, Andre, algorithm for our diligence. Like it takes into a lot of factors background, education, technical competence, you know, uh, you know, are you a second time founder? That's a big boost. You know, we factor all of those things in, but then ultimately we have to look at people face to face. And that's why I love to see them on the whiteboard thinking out loud. And that's where you see the passion and the understanding, the deep insights uh, into a space. We will invest in those people. And, and let me, um, thanks for that, Tim. I'm going to, I'm going to, divert here. And um, Gabri, I'm going to ask you this question. I've got a Larry Clay who chimed in here. Um, and, and let me see if I can surmise what he's asking. But basically, he was talking about your, your artifact as being an example of a, um, a strengths-based approach um, to benefiting the whole system, right? If you think about the music game that you're talking about, not just another product or service in the market. Can you, can you sh shed any light on that? I know we've had that conversation, um, you know, before. And um, any thoughts you want to add, you know, to that? Yeah, I, I'd like to. I'd like to combine these two topics in a way. Uh, first of all, I want to speak directly to a black founder right now. Uh, so, you know, we uh, most of us were raised in a way that we knew we were told by our parents that we were going to have to be two times better, three times better, ten times better because of the adversity we face, and that's real. So when it comes to the technical challenges, when it comes to the knowledge that you do have and the knowledge that you don't have, you're going to have to go out there and just get it. You know, we're used to facing those kinds of challenges and taking on challenges because that's what life shaped us to be and life has shaped us to do. So uh, I'd like to just, you know, emphasize that, that we, we have... Uh, We've faced adversity and we know how to move through it. And these emotions and all the challenges that come with this and the, uh, the unstable feelings that come with being a founder, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're made to face that. You know, we're, we're used to facing that. So, uh, so it can happen. And, you know, speaking about the strengths-based approach and sort of, uh, uh, you know, the domain expertise, you know, there, there are areas where I had a lot of expertise. There were areas where I had no expertise, uh, especially with Andre and the consulting just that he did on these slides. He was just going through it in, in, in Andre's uh, amazing way that he does. Those are things to embrace. And when you do, you, you onboard these other uh, mindsets and cultures that know a side of business that you don't, you have to make sure that you're, con you're connecting to those people. And for us, it was that guide stone of customer discovery that led us to an area. It, it was no moment of brilliance for sound credit where we were just like, oh, this is where we go. It was through talking with customers, talking to companies, talking to every layer of the company, most importantly, the front line 
that is more familiar with the problems than the executives are. And from that, through those understanding those problems, hearing those problems, iterating on those problems, taking that first mover advantage and making sure that we're, uh, that we're running with that, we're maintaining that first mover advantage. We found that problem first, we're addressing that problem first, well, no one's gonna catch up with us on it. And I'll just never forget, you know, sitting in Goldman Sachs International offices in London and sitting with the head researcher that did uh, the research that the music industry is going to more than double to 141 billion in 2030 and the recognition that we had occupied the, uh, the most critical space in that growth. And yeah, that did not come from a moment of brilliance or even my background. In fact, the background and the, 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 uh, the sort of ego of, oh, I know this, that has to be pushed aside. You have to observe the discovery. You have to observe the problems uh, hear from folks. And, you know, you can filter that through your insight, but the insight can, it can be something that you have to watch out for too. You have to make sure that you're, uh, you're getting it directly from those people experiencing the problems and then filter it. So this is great. Before we um, got a couple questions here, before we um, make some announcements, I want to make sure I know Tim and, and Gabri, you mentioned uh, folks reaching out to you. Um, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Do you, is there an email they can reach out to or, or something along those lines? Yeah, I, I'll go first. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say, uh, Gabri, I wish the heck I'd met you for your first raise, friend. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, that's precisely the kind of people we want to meet. Uh, very impressive. The, the way you talk is very impressive. Uh, your insights are very impressive. And so congratulations on that. Uh, to, to contact B Partners, it's easy. It's, uh, our URL is bpartners.vc. That's B-E-E, -E, like the buzzing B. B-E-E partners.vc, event for venture capital. Uh, my personal email address, and I would invite anyone on this call uh, to reach out directly to me if you have an idea or if you have questions or if you have people you want to introduce or anything. My email address is tim, T-I-M, at bpartners.vc, and I would, I would welcome the communication. And for me, it's gabri.waddell at gmail.com. My company is Sound Credit. You can find me on Twitter, Gabri Waddell. You can find me. And I'd like to speak to that, you know, uh, to those black founders again. And I'd also like to speak to just everyone on this call. And this is what I will say to you is that with this racial reckoning that's going on in this moment, I know you have to feel that, you know, you've got to, you want to do something. You know, you see the protests that are going on, you see what's going on in this moment, and you've got to use your platform to make a, make a change in the way that is natural for you. And the way to do that that I see, you know, for us for, as, as business people is to make sure that any company that's private that does not have a diversity inclusion officer, you need that you have any relationship at any high level with at all. This is time for you to make sure that you have that conversation with them and you get that person in place. You know, that you encourage that person to be in place. And once that, if that person is already in place or someone becomes in place, then have that conversation about supplier diversity with them and make sure that there is a policy that expresses a goal percentage because the key to entrepreneurship in this age is partnerships. It's not direct to consumer. Direct to consumer was mid 2000s and early 2010s. Consumers have turned off the noise of ads. You build a business today through partnerships. And so that is a key. The key to entrepreneurship is partnerships. And the key to social mobility and the change that we need to see in our community is, is, is are those, those entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurship. So we have to see this change in social in the, uh, it, it, you know, and make sure that the supplier diversity is there so that we have a pathway to those partnerships. So I just wanted to deliver that message to you and give people an option of, of something they can do in this moment. Thanks, Kabri. We got we to gotta move on. Um, Want to make a couple of announcements here um, before we close. The National Black MBA is actually uh, rolling their annual scale-up pitch competition out. Um, it can be found on the website um, www.nbmbaa.org. 
And um, we welcome you to, if you want to find out more information on how to enter in and apply and to qualify for pitching um, with a finalist to win $50,000, uh, second place $10,000, third place $2,500, you can reach out to Leanne, L-E-A-N-N, -N, at neverstop.co to ask for more information. And there'll be a few tip sessions that are coming up here pretty soon. And so we hope that you will look into this and take advantage. And I'm going to hand things back off to Paula, who kicked us off here um, as well. Thank you all so much for this incredible content. I absolutely learned uh, many different things. And Gabri, I will say to you that I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your looking directly into that camera and speaking positivity and thoughtfulness into our members. So again, to all three of you, thank you so much for your time. If you too appreciated this session, please look to the right. You will see a survey link where you could give us your feedback on this session and more to make sure that we are on target with the programming that we are providing to you. The first 25 people to click on that link and fill out the survey will be entered in a chance to win an Amazon gift card. So don't delay in doing that. Please uh, be mindful that part three of our series sales process and operations to match will be on August 4th at 1 p.m. So you want to make sure that you um, register for that as well. As Andre mentioned, for all of you entrepreneurs out there, be sure to sign up for our Scale Up Pitch Challenge, which is sponsored by FedEx. We would love to have you as part of that competition. And then finally, again, as we mentioned at the top of the hour, if you have not already done so, register to attend our first ever uh, conference and career fair, which will be a virtual experience. And you will see a link to that to the right at the chat box as well. Have a wonderful afternoon and see you again soon.